Whether you're here in person this morning or you're here electronically, I want to welcome you. The Day of the Christian Martyr is a solemn occasion because we're talking about sacrifice, but it's also a joyous occasion because we're talking about Jesus and the advancement of his kingdom. As we begin this time together, I want to talk to you about inspiration, how we can be inspired by those who came before us, and especially by those who were willing to lay down their lives for the cause of Christ. One of the questions that we have asked on our Facebook page, which always produces an interesting response, is this one. What is the first story of a martyr outside of the Bible that you heard or read or saw? God uses stories to inspire and challenge us. He uses the stories of people who were willing to sacrifice their lives to inspire each one of us to ask, what would I sacrifice? What would I be willing to give up to see the name of Christ glorified among people of every tribe and tongue and nation? So other than the Bible, what's the first story of a martyr that you heard? The one that still sticks in your heart and in your mind? For me, the answer to that question is the story of a man named Stanley Albert Dale. His story is told in a book by Don Richardson called Lords of the Earth. My dad read that book to my brother and I when I was 10 years old. Stanley Dale was an Australian missionary to the island of New Guinea. Stanley was someone who you would call hard-headed and stubborn. He grew up in a dysfunctional family. He joined the Australian military and they first sent him to New Guinea an island where more than a thousand languages are spoken. And God grabbed a hold of Stanley's heart for thousands of tribesmen who had no chance of hearing the gospel message. It was not an easy assignment. And frankly, a less stubborn man would have gone home many times. At one point, Stanley's mission board fired him. So he went back to Australia, he got more training, he got married and he went back to New Guinea with a second mission board. He learned a local tribal language and he began translating the scriptures and even writing some hymns in the local dialect. That second mission board also fired him. So he came home and then went back again, this time to the Dutch controlled side of the island of New Guinea, a part of what is now Indonesia. And Stanley went to some of the most rural and rugged parts of the island, and he began to plant gospel seeds among a people called the Yali. And there was fruit eventually, and some of the Yali began to follow Jesus Christ. But the gospel upset some of their tribal ways, and not all of the Yali were happy with Stanley or with his message. On September 25th, 1968, Stanley Dale was killed along with a fellow missionary named Phil Masters. Stanley Dale faced the assembled Yali warriors head on as he was shot repeatedly with a bow and arrows. As each arrow struck him, he would pull it out, break it in half, and drop it on the ground. Phil Masters was watching and he was inspired by Stanley's example so that when the Yali turned to him, he too faced them and death head on. When a search team arrived on the river beach where those two men were killed, they found hundreds of broken arrows. I believe that God will never waste the sacrifice of his servants, and he certainly did not waste the blood of Stanley Dale and Phil Masters. People around the world began to pray fervently for the Yali people a people that they never would have even heard of if not for a stubborn Australian missionary. And within four years, some of the same men who shot arrows into Stanley Dale and Phil Masters were being baptized as new believers in Jesus Christ. What would inspire a man to willingly lay down his life for the cause of Christ? In the case of Stanley Dale, he left some clues. In 1950, Stanley Dale preached a sermon in Australia where he talked about William Tyndale, whose name is inscribed on the wall behind me. 
Tyndale translated the Bible into English, a crime for which he paid with his life. Tyndale's passion to have God's word available in the language of every man inspired Stanley Dale, and one of the things that Stan was working on in the months before his death was translating parts of the New Testament into the Yali language. So William Tyndale's example inspired Stanley Dale, and Stanley Dale's example inspired me as a 10-year-old boy. And 20 some odd years later, I'm working at Voice of the Martyrs and we're putting together a book called Extreme Devotion. And I got to write the story of Stanley Dale for a whole new generation of readers to take that inspiration in and let it inspire them. It's day 326, by the way, if you're looking for it. And that book was translated into Chinese and went to believers all over China. And it was translated into Arabic and went to believers all over the Middle East. And the example of Stanley Dale kept spreading and inspiring new believers. The Gronwald family, who we're adding to the Martyrs Memorial today, is that kind of example. The kind of godly example that I hope my grandkids and great-grandkids will read about and hear about and be inspired by someday. But in order for that inspiration to happen, we, all of us, have to share these stories. And that's my challenge for you today. As we gather to honor the Gronwalds and all of those who have laid down their lives for Christ, I started out with a question, who, other than in the Bible, was the first martyr story that you heard? I want to end with a challenge. Tell that story to somebody today. Maybe you're going to share this video and inspire people with the story of the Gronwalds, a family that went to Afghanistan after 9-11. Maybe you're going to share the story that inspired you as a child on social media for all of your friends to be inspired by as well. Maybe you're going to order a copy of Lords of the Earth and read the story of Stanley Dale to your 10-year-old son. Maybe you're going to tell the story of William Tyndale or Jim Elliott or John Chow. Think again of that story that inspired you. Now think of how you're going to pass that inspiration on to someone else. Don't be satisfied with being inspired alone. Pass the inspiration on to other believers. Because who knows how that story will lodge in the heart of the person that you share it with. Who knows how God will use the story that you tell to call others to himself and into his service. Perhaps God will use the story that you tell to call someone into a work and a sacrifice that my great-granddaughter will read to her 10-year-old son someday. In the fifth chapter of Acts, we read a truly supernatural account. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Throughout all of history, there's been an unbroken chain of faithful witnesses, faithful servants of God and faithful witnesses for Christ. I've never been touched more deeply in my life than when I traveled into Afghanistan a little over 10 years ago and met a whole group of faithful witnesses for Christ on a frontier mission field who really exemplified this, who really were taking a place in this unbroken chain of faithful witnesses and really ministered to my heart and challenged me and have inspired me ever since. All the different frontier missions, fields that I've been on and all the faithful witnesses that I've interviewed, no group of Christians have ever inspired me like this. Among that group were the Gronwalds who we honor today. Also among that group was John Weaver and his family, uh, who you'll hear in a moment. This group of individuals had been serving in Afghanistan, some of them before the September 11th attacks, going through the attacks and, and continuing onward, and had watched one after another of their fellow co-laborers for Christ die and suffer and pay the ultimate price 
and yet they stayed as a faithful witness for Christ. And in the midst of their suffering, which was very real and very tangible, they considered it a joy and an honor to be able to represent Christ and serve faithfully in that way. And so it was a little over 10 years ago, I went to Afghanistan, and I saw these faithful witnesses, these believers. Gail Williams, whose name is on this wall, had just been assassinated a couple weeks prior to the time when I was there in Afghanistan. And in the midst of the sorrow of this community I'm describing, of faithful witnesses, the main concern was how can we stay and how can we maintain the faithful witness of Christ in this place among people who definitely oppose Christ and definitely oppose us and hold us as their enemies, even though we serve them in love. And this group of individuals inspired me deeply. We're meant to be inspired by those who came before us. We're meant to look at the book of Acts and see the apostles go away from a beating rejoicing and serving faithfully. We're meant to look at examples like those on this wall, those who have paid the ultimate price and those who pay a price every single day to faithfully serve their Lord. The apostles rejoiced because eternity was worth it, because God is worth it, because Jesus Christ our Lord is worth it. They rejoice in the suffering of this world. The Groenwalds faithfully served, and to this day, Hana Lee, who's the only survivor of their family of that attack, considers that it was worth it to go. It was worth it when they stayed. After Gail's killing, after other killings, it was worth it as they stayed, and she considers today that it was worth the price that was paid. It's my pleasure to introduce to you John Weaver, who's one of that group of faithful witnesses I described, a long-term servant in Afghanistan. Uh, who will share more this morning. God bless you. Thank you. We know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We know that God sent his son into the world to save us because he loves us. Amen. And we also know in a similar way, God loved the people of Afghanistan so much. God sent the Gronawad family to Afghanistan back in 2003. Those of us who were in the country at the time, we believed it was an answer to prayer. We saw it as God answering many, many prayers for God to send forth labors. What did the Lord Jesus tell us? He said the harvest is great, but the labors are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth, that he would thrust forth laborers into his harvest field. So those of us who were living and serving in Afghanistan, when the Grotalon family arrived, we were so blessed, so encouraged, and saw this as an answer to prayer. And I want to remind us this morning, today, whenever you might watch this, it was the Lord of the harvest that sent Werner and Hanali and Jean-Pierre in Rode. It was the Lord of the harvest that sent them to Afghanistan. Now we know Werner was a very faithful pastor in South Africa before the Lord sent him uh, to Afghanistan. It was the events of 9-11, as it was for many of us who remember that day, that the Lord really began to work in his life. That led him on a journey on his first mission trip to Pakistan, where God again further worked in his life, giving him an expanded love and a heart for the nations and a desire to see Muslims come to Christ. He shares that with Hanali, and God begins stirring in her heart as well. They go back together to Pakistan and eventually into Afghanistan on a medical mission trip. And God confirmed to them that it was his will, the Lord of the harvest, wanted to send them into Afghanistan. Now, of course, at the time, they had two small children. Jean-Pierre was only five years old. Rodé was only three. Of course, his loving parents, they were concerned. What about our kids? What will this look like for us as a family in Afghanistan? But bigger than all of that, they knew that the Lord of the harvest, the King of the nations, the Lord Jesus Christ was calling them. And they responded in faith. They responded in obedience. God rallied a team around them. And from South Africa in the year 2003, they were sent to the capital of Afghanistan. They were a family on mission. Now sure, Jean-Pierre and Rodé didn't fully understand the call of God on their parents, but they had a huge impact even as children. 
Most of us would think about Werner and the impact that he had as a spiritual leader in the community, not just among the expatriate uh, believers that were there, but specifically among the Afghans. Instantly, he, he created respect and rapport with the Afghans and had a huge impact on them. Being a pastor, part of his passion was from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where the apostle Paul who was an evangelist, who was a church planner, was pouring into young Timothy, saying, whatever you've seen and heard and learned from me, you pass that on to others. And that was Werner's passion. That's why he did educational programs. That's why he did leadership training and leadership development. That's why he was involved in spiritual ministry. He knew if he could invest in some Afghans, they eventually would invest in other Afghans and things in terms of discipleship and spiritual ministry would spread throughout Afghanistan. Now, Hanali, she had a huge impact as well as a loving wife, primarily in support of her husband, but also as a loving mother, raising up Jean-Pierre and Rodé. They called Jean-Pierre JP, by the way. If you've read that, JP would mean uh, Jean-Pierre. But her love and investment in her children and raising them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. She also was a very gifted and skilled medical doctor, and she used those skills in Afghanistan as well, not just in clinics, but in hospitals and also training. Uh, local uh, men and women who were involved in the, the medical field. And Jean-Pierre and Rodet, though they were little when they first arrived in Afghanistan, they were teenagers. Jean-Pierre was 17 when this attack happened. Rodet was 15 when this attack happened. They were also having a huge impact among the community, again, not just among expats, but even among Afghans that they interacted with through the schools that they attended and through the families. Uh, Werner had a whole network of Afghan families and along with Hana Lee with her medical services that they were daily interacting at their house and in the projects that they were involved in. And Jean-Pierre and Rodet were involved in some of that as well. And as teenagers who followed Jesus, who loved Jesus, who at this time knew God's call, it wasn't just the call of their parents. They knew things like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. They knew that Jesus said, go all into all the world and, and preach the gospel. They knew their father's passion about, let's make disciples who will make disciples. They, they knew that, and they, they owned that, and they were having a huge impact uh, themselves. This was a family that was on mission, that was obeying the call of God, that was faithfully serving, laying down their lives every day, being sought being light, being the hands and feet of Jesus there uh, in Afghanistan. I wanted to tell a story that um, I don't know has been told that much as we think about the day of Christian martyrs. This was a fellow mutual friend that we had in Afghanistan that was also martyred in the year of 2014. Those of us who were living in the country in the year 2014, it was a very, very difficult time because of friends that were laying down their lives uh, for the gospel. One will, his real name is Jerry, so we'll call him Dr. Jerry. He's Dr. Jerry, and he works at a hospital. Hana Lee had frequented the, that hospital as well. My first son was born in that hospital uh, as well. A lot of Afghans had been ministered to in that hospital. A lot of Afghans for the very first time had someone pray for them in Jesus' name and extend the love of Christ to them for the very first time as they were there uh, as, as patients. Well, one morning in April 2014, a very tragic thing happened. The Dr. Jerry was there with two other friends, followers of Jesus, and they were martyred. They were killed. There was a lady that was watching this. There were actually several people that were watching this, but there was an Afghan lady that was watching this. Jump forward a year or so, she's introduced to some fellow followers of the Lord Jesus Christ in her country, in Afghanistan, local Afghan believers who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And they begin sharing with her the love of Jesus, for God so loved the world. They begin sharing with her the good news and the hope of eternity through the Lord Jesus Christ. And she opens up her heart and says... I've never told anybody this. This has been haunting me. I mean that in a good way. God's been doing something in my heart because of this. She said the morning that Dr. Jerry and John Gable and his father were killed, I was there and saw this. And I saw angels coming down and took them to heaven. And I was struck with this because I knew these were not Muslim men. These were foreigners. These were probably followers of Jesus. And how in the world could it be that when they died, they went to heaven? And this stuck in her heart until finally she meets 
some fellow Christ followers who began to share with her what Jesus says, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now her testimony is uh, that she knows the living hope that we have. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's given us a living hope because of the resurrection of the dead. If she were standing here with us right now, she would say their martyrdom, their sacrifice was not in vain. God used that as part of my own story of bringing me to faith in the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Now back to the Gronewald family. I just want to close with Today we're remembering them, we're honoring them. It's been a few years since this has happened, but yet we, are want to, we want to honor them and we want to honor a lot of others. There are others on the wall over here. I think of the medical team in 2010. They were in a very, very remote area of, of Afghanistan. And, uh, and I wish we could tell a lot of stories about how there are unreached people groups that are up there. And now there's Bible translation projects that are going on in those languages. God, again, has remembered the sacrifice and the blood that was shed uh, in that medical team that went up to those, uh, to those remote uh, mountains. Uh, on behalf of Werner, I don't know what it means when we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Uh, but one impact that Werner left on all of us that knew him was he was a man that lived without fear. He was absolutely committed, not only to his love for Jesus and his commitment to follow Jesus, but the ministry that he knew God had given him to fulfill in Afghanistan. And I don't know if he's listening now. I don't know how all that works, but I just want to say uh, that there are disciples in Afghanistan who are making disciples. There are Afghans who follow Jesus, who are helping others uh, to follow Jesus. And many of them were impacted and influenced by the Gronewald family. So what a privilege. Yes, it's a bittersweet experience. I'm sorry that Hannah Lee is not here. Greetings from her. And she would remind us, it is well with her soul. She knows that God, in some ways, had prepared their family for this. They had talked about this before. We all know that a month before this, Werner was at a conference, and at times people would ask, you know, is it worth the risk? Are you sure you need to still be in this country? And his response, as we all know, was, hey, we're only going to die once. We might as well die for Jesus. Now, so what I'd like for us to do for just a moment, if you don't mind, if we were in Afghanistan, we might open our hands like this. And so I'll invite you with me if you'd like. We're going to open our hands like this. And Father, we just want to thank you. We want to give you thanks that we can remember this dear family, our precious brother Werner and Jean-Pierre and Rodet. We thank you that we can remember them. And we want to echo the words of Holy Scripture that you, the Lord, you give and you take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we want to echo what Hanalee has said. It is well with our souls because of, first of all, the blood of the Lord Jesus that was shed to redeem us, to save us. And we thank you for the salvation, the gift of eternal life we have because of the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again. And Father, we want to echo Werner's prayer where he would say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And whether by life or death, may the Lord be glorified. And Father, we want to echo the prayer of that dear lady and thousands upon thousands of Afghans who now know the truth of the gospel. We pray, would you save the people of Afghanistan? Would you let your light shine there? Would you remember the sacrifices? We, in agreement today, honor those who have given their life, not just in Afghanistan, but all over the world, and those in the future that might be called uh, to, to martyr them, those that might enter into that great number around your throne that cry out to you daily, Lord, Lord, how long? And you say, not until their full number is reached. Father, we remember on the day of Christian martyr, we remember the sacrifice of those, and we pray, would you honor that, and would you look down upon that, and would you bring forth fruit from that, Father, throughout Afghanistan and throughout the nations of the earth, as we remember Werner and Jean-Pierre and Rodé and others that have gone before us, we pray in Jesus' name. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we give you praise and we give you honor and we just thank you for this opportunity for us to gather together today, Lord God, for this occasion to remember our brothers and our sisters, Lord God, especially the Gornwall family. Lord, we just ask you to bless the men and women, Christians who are throughout the world ministering to men and women who do not know you. We ask you to bless them, to guide them, to lead them, Lord God, to stir them up, to stir their hearts, Lord God, to help them to be committed to you no matter the cost, because you are worth the cost, Lord God. We love you today, Lord God, and we just want to honor you. We want to lift you up both in word and in deed, and we thank you for men and women, for Christians who have made a commitment to be able to bring the word of God to those who do not know you. We love you. We just want to be with you, Lord God. We want to share the word with those who are lost and are unaware of who you are. We thank you on this day for this family. We thank you for the men and women throughout the world, Christians, Lord God, who are committed to you. We give you praise and honor. In Jesus' holy, glorious name, amen. So we continue to pray. Heavenly Father, you are truly an amazing God. The things that you do and the things that you bring to us are simply amazing. It's the small things in life that confound us. No one knows how a plant grows, but plants grow everywhere. And you feed the population of this earth. Lord, you, your amazement never ceases. And yet, you loved us. You loved us when we were unworthy. And you sent a son that died, that suffered and died. And today, Lord, we're celebrating people that have done just that that look like Jesus. They, uh, they suffer and they bleed and they die. You're an amazing God. And Lord, I pray that um, this time we spent honoring the Grunewald family will not be in vain, but other people will see this love and be inspired. We've met them, and we know they were average people and living an average life, and you called them out, and you said, go, and they went. They were faithful. They were obedient, and then they demonstrated that love. So, Lord, thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for the lives. Thank you, Lord, for our life, and, Lord, help us each one to demonstrate that love to the people around us. Lord, we humbly pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you the honor this morning, Father. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, God. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us, Father. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you made the way for your Father to become our Father. Oh, Father, we worship you and we praise you, Father. We thank you, Lord God, for these great clouds of witnesses, Lord, that are around us, Father. Lord, help us. Help us, the church in America, Father. Lord, to seek you with our whole hearts, Father. Help us, Lord, to make that decision now to lay down our lives, Lord, so that when that time comes, if it comes, Father, you said that your grace will be there with us, Father, to take us through, Lord. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, how you use us, Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, how you have mercy upon us, Father. We thank you, Lord, how you heal our bodies, Lord. You take care 
care of our families, Father. Lord, what can we render unto you, Lord, for all your goodness and your greatness, Lord? Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for these witnesses, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that they set an example for us to follow, Lord. Help us, Lord, especially us in America, Father. Lord, to lay down our lives, Father. Lord, to seek you like we've never sought you before, Father. Lord, you said that darkness is coming upon the earth, Lord, but that we would shine as lights, Father. Help us to be those lights, Father. Help us to spread your word, Father, to be that light, to be that witness, Lord. And when it comes time, Lord, to lay down our lives, Lord, as others have done before us, Father. And Lord, it is our privilege, Lord, and our honor, Lord, and we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for stretching out your hand to us always, Father. And Lord, we just praise you for this day, Lord, and we thank you for all the things that you've done for us, Father. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, say that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. High King of Heaven, my treasure Thou art. High King of Heaven, my victory won. May I reach Heaven's joys, O bright Heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever be still be my vision o ruler of all still be my vision o ruler of all In Luke 21, the Lord Jesus <clears throat> was preparing his disciples for the persecution. He was telling them that they will be brought before religious as well as secular authorities because of his name. They will be put in prison. But he told them, this will be your opportunity to bear witness. A few verses later, he tells them that some of them will be delivered up by their parents relatives or friends and again a few verses later he told them that some of them will be killed in john 15 from verse 18 to 21 we find a scriptural foundation of persecution theology the words that the lord jesus said to his disciples <clears throat> he gives us the true reason why we as christians should expect persecution. He said, the world hates you because you are not of this world. If you were of this world, the world would love you. But he said also that the world hated me way before it hated you. He said, the disciple is not greater than his master. They have persecuted me, they will persecute you. And so uh, we can also read uh, from Apostle Paul how he was preparing the early Christians uh, in 2 Timothy 3.12 by telling them that everyone who wants to live 
godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone who wants to follow Christ's words, as, he, as we read them in the Bible, should expect persecution. In one sense, the persecution is an essential part of a Christian life. In Acts 1, verse 8, uh, we as Christ's followers, we are called to be his witnesses unto the end of this world. But the Greek word witnesses means actually also martyrs because that's the same word. When we are called to be Christ's witnesses till the end of this world, we are called to be Christ's martyrs till the end of this world. Standing here today at this uh, wall of martyrs that has a limited number of names, maybe those most well-known martyrs, we are reminded of the great cloud of witnesses, and again, great cloud of martyrs uh, that uh, uh, were and went uh, to the Lord before us. I'm especially proud that I can also see uh, two Czech names, uh, people from my country. Uh, especially, I can see uh, Jan Hus, or as you say in English, John Hus, or Jerome of Prague. By the way, you know, when I was uh, in the Sudanese prison for 445 days, my wife was reading Jan Hus's letters from Constance, from place where Jan Hus on July the 6th, 1415, was martyred by being burned at a stake. I'm sure that uh, secular psychologists would not recommend that reading to my wife and her husband was in prison. But I can tell you that she was deeply encouraged by reading Jan Hus's words and his commitment to Christ. And even though he was facing the death penalty. I too was facing death penalty in Sudan, being accused of espionage. And one day when my wife went to refuel her car and went to the gas station, she, her eyes were caught by the, one of the Czech daily newspapers. On the first page, there was a title, Czech citizen held in Sudan, facing death penalty. When I was in prison, in different difficult situations, the Lord reminded me of uh, the heroes of faith that I had uh, the privilege to meet with or read about. When I was being interrogated, I reminded myself of uh, the words of my father, what he shared after he was interrogated by the communist secret police. When I was in solitary confinement, I reminded myself of Richard Wombrandt and his situation and how the Lord was sustaining him in the difficult situation. <clears throat> when I was going through difficult situation in prison of the daily life there, I reminded myself of the words of my relatives who spent years in communist prison in Czechoslovakia. There were moments when I felt pity for myself. I was several months in prison, but the Lord showed me through my spiritual eyes a pictures of uh, three Eritrean brothers whom I and my wife met when we were in Eritrea. At that time, they were in prison already for 12 years. And I had this private wall of living martyrs in my cell. And I started to pray fervently for them. By the way, all three of them are still in prison in Eritrea. I too was surrounded by the great cloud of these witnesses, of these living martyrs, when I was in prison. You know, in the Revelation 12, 11, we read about the overcomers. <clears throat> 
And they did it through the blood of the Lamb, through the word of their testimony, because they loved not their lives even unto death. In Romans 8, from verse uh, 36 to 39, Paul is describing those who are called more than conquerors. But if you read the few verses before that, you will realize that to be more than a conqueror sometimes may mean that you are considered like the sheep to be slaughtered. As we saw already in the Luke 21, the different roles that the Lord Jesus was telling his disciples, we are all parts of the body of Christ, of his church, and everyone has a different role to play. Not all of us are called to die for Christ. But when you open Romans 12, 1, we are supposed to present, and we are called to present our bodies as living sacrifices. May the Lord give us all the courage and the commitment to continue serve Him in this earth without looking at the future, not knowing what kind of role the Lord Jesus will ask us to play in his, in his church. <laughs>